Here's the thing about life. Life is hard. And throughout this journey that we're all on, we are going to come across challenges. We're going to find ourselves facing adversity. And many times we're going to find ourselves in very difficult situations. But it's not those difficult situations that we find ourselves in that define us. It's how we overcome them that defines us. Most people's default setting is to face something difficult and to quit and to give up and to say, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, it's too hard. And it is hard. It's very, very hard, constantly hard, but it can be done. Just look at the situation that you're facing and think, okay, here's what I got. How am I gonna deal with it? Choosing how you react to the situations you find yourself in, that's what makes the difference between winning and losing. I think a lot of people hugely underestimate what they're capable of. People don't believe in themselves enough anymore. You know, they find something difficult and they get scared and they give in to fear and they listen to the people around them that say, you're not good enough, you can't do it, it's too hard. So we deployed to Afghanistan on the 7th of September 2007 and when we got in the country, uh, myself and the company that I was working in were positioned in the southern region of the Helmand province working out of a place called Forward Operating Base Robinson. Our responsibilities included things like foot patrolling. So we would go into local villages, we would engage with the civilians that worked there. We would provide them with food, with water, with security, with reassurance. Now, considering where we were and what we were doing, you know, things were going relatively well. We had come into contact with the enemy on several different occasions, and we had never sustained any injuries, and we never sustained any fatalities. Morale was high. We were doing what we were sent there to do. We were helping the people that were there, and we were doing it very successfully. Now on Christmas Eve, we were given a brief on what was to be our next foot patrol. We were given the green light, the gate was opened and we left. I was in the section that went north, the other guys went south. We engaged with civilians, we reassured them that we were there to help them. We just happened to find ourselves positioned on a really high piece of ground, probably the highest piece of ground for a good mile, mile and a half. And I kind of stood back and, and just let everyone do their thing. Um, and thought, you know, I'll be the last one to get in position. The time came for me to go and take it. Now, as I slowly started walking over towards it, I went to get down onto my belly, and as my right knee hit the floor, that was the moment that I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. Well, I was born and bred here. Um, you know, born in 1983, Freedom Fields Hospital, which no longer exists. I grew up uh, close to the city centre, uh, a place called Pennycombe Quick. Everything I really needed was, was centralised. I lived by a place called Central Park. So we had the city centre one side and then, you know, the green of the park, the other side for running around and exercising in. Pretty, pretty regular, you know, I was pretty fortunate. Being Mark's twin, I sort of grew up as one of the lads around the area because it was all boys playing tracker in the massive field behind the house and you know just getting into all sorts and um yeah we'd go off and just do naughty things like that <laughs> they were mischievous obviously <laughs> like instead of playing with their toys they like pots and pans and in the garden, all of a sudden, my beautiful flowers used to disappear and I'd be offered a bunch. <laughs> I loved that. They were a joy to have. We really enjoyed it, and especially his gramps. He was out of this world with them, you know. You know, my, my granddad was a big influence. He worked hard all of his life to provide for his family, and, and that's something that I like to think that he instilled in me. My husband and I, Fred, always thought that we was in our 
bringing up our own son, but having the joy of having the girl as well, because of being twins. But I can honestly say, and I mean it, they were no trouble. Mark, or though he'd have a rough and tumble and be, he was always very gentle, very respectful to both myself and his, my husband Fred. The amount of times I had a Van Damme kick to the face when he was kickboxing was, <laughs> that was annoying. Um, I used to get pillows on my head because he thought it was a steel chair because he was in WWE or whatever it's called. <laughs> but yeah, it was, um, it was fun. I went to a place called Hyde Park Infant School and then progressed to the junior school. Um, and then when we left there, Stoke Downwell Community College. So my education was pretty cool because it was uninterrupted. One thing that stands out for me was when I was about 12. Um, oh, I was quite chubby at school. And I remember one day I was sat down at break time in like a booth in the canteen and I was eating this cream slice thing. And as I was sat down, kind of the button, where the buttons of my shirt were, it was kind of opened up. But this is all still the same. This is where I remember trying out for the school football team. And I got, I got in the B team, never been a footballer. It's kind of like a duty of 10 thing. Um, and I was, I was garbage at football, but I managed to make the B team somehow. I was sat here with my mates, um, just chilling out at lunchtime. And I think up these stairs was maths, that was my tutor group was. And I can't remember what the reason was, but one of the guys two years above me came marching out the door of a purpose. I was sat here on the thing and he just went poof and just socked me right in the eye, knocked me off the back of the, back of the uh, post. I, don't, I have no idea why, I can't remember. Um, but I remember it hurt a lot. Mark came back to, do, um, to be our guest speaker. And that was 2009, wasn't it? Yeah. Because I remember that, that was 10 years after I left. Yeah. See, even that was, seemed a long, long time ago. And little George. George yeah, George Wilton. Did a poem for you. Yeah, it's, it's, on, my, it's on my office wall above yeah. my computer. And mm -hmm. um, after he read it out, um, you, you couldn't hear a pin drop, mm. did you? No, I remember. You couldn't hear a pin drop. Royal Marine Mark Ormrod, a very brave man. To gain Britain's security, the Marines had a plan but a routine patrol in the Afghanistan desert that for him ended in an explosive bang. In the middle of his hell, his comrades were calm, treating his wounds with care. They'd make sure he'd come to no more harm. I was eating like a, one of those cream pie things and one of the lads came up to me and where I was sat down and my, my shirt buttons were kind of open and then you could see in sideways. They kind of looked through and then they said to me, oh, your, your body's disgusting. Like that, and then it really like it just was like boof when it hit me. Oh. Not, not many things really affect me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went about my, my business that day, and I was like, right, I'm not having that. Yeah. And so I used to literally every lunchtime, that's why I became a, like a PE prefect. Yeah. I locked myself in that little gym where the finance office is now. Yeah. Not many people know that. I kind of kept that to myself until now. Yeah. So this is kind of where a lot of stuff started for me. I had never really thought about it before. You know, I was a young kid, you know, doing what young kids do, filling my face with junk food. And for some reason, that, that one comment from that kid really affected me. You know, in that moment, even at like 12 years old, I decided that I was gonna do something about it because I didn't like the way that made me feel. So I came here, um, not to the finance office. This used to be a small gym at the school. You can kind of, you can see the scarring from where the door used to be. And so literally the next day after that situation uh, in the canteen, I, I came in here at lunch times and started training. From my memory, that's where my love affair with fitness really started. I guess I became kind of addicted to that feeling. It's, it's nice to come back, mate. It's nice to come back and you know, to see all the older things that are still the same, see the new things that have changed. I bumped into very briefly some of the teachers that were here um, when I was here. Obviously, headmistress Carol. All in all, um, 
a very productive day, not just for filming, but you know, just for me in general. Because I had been doing this fitness and I had really liked the way it made me feel and it's something that I wanted to do, I decided I wanted a career what was going to enable me to keep that up and to be fit, to be active, to be healthy. And so that's really what led me into the, the career in the Royal Marines. You know, I just, I knew I wanted to join the military and I knew that I really wanted to challenge myself. You know, I, I'm, I, was, I was all in, like tripling down on it, thinking if I'm going to go in, I'm going to go in. I want to do the hardest thing they've got. I want to challenge myself. And if I pass it, there's my career for the next however many years. You always wanted to go in the Marines. And that was what he aimed for. And that's what he'd done. And he was so proud of being a Marine. Good on you. If that's what you want to do, yeah. you go and do it. And, you know, it seemed to bring out the best in him and it was, it was the right path for him. When I was a kid, I used to be able to lie on my bed in the house that I grew up in and kind of look out my window and no more than 250 metres from where I was was a train station. So, you know, I used to see trains coming and going all the time. And after I went down to the careers centre when I was 16 and I had applied to join the Royal Marines, I used to look at that train station in a completely different light and just imagine when that day came around when I got on that train and went to embark on this journey. I knew it was going to be tough. You know, just being away from home at that age for me was intimidating and was tough. I knew the physical challenge was going to be tough. Eventually, the day came around and I found myself only about 250, 300 metres from my bedroom on this train station platform, about to get on this train and effectively take myself from boy to man. Am I going to be good enough? Uh, and if not, could I face coming back home, having failed? I never got on that train in the first place with the intention of failing. So there are a bunch of us, um, shirts, ties, suits, bags, boots, everything, on this train. We got off. It was just like the the recruiting videos that you see. There was a, a drill instructor on the platform with a clipboard under his arm, with names. Immediately, you know, we're into military routine. Everyone stand in order, stand to attention, put your kit down, answer your name, get in single file, march through camp, follow me, here's your accommodation, bang. Like baptism by fire. You, you go from being a civilian to a, a member of the military very quickly. Just watched a bunch of lads get off the train. Eight of them have already gone up. The, uh, the Corporal DL came down with his pace stick and his clipboard. And I felt nervous for them because they, they were all stumbling, not knowing whether to call him Corporal or Mate. And uh, you know, he's giving them the death stare and writing things down on his clipboard. And I don't know why, I just got the nerves came back. I just felt nervous for them. But I get the butterflies again here and back in the foundation block probably because it was the very start of the journey for me. I don't know. As nervous as these guys probably are, I expect they're equally as excited. And, uh, you know, they've got a hell of a journey ahead of them. I remember getting into this room, what we call the foundation block, and there were, there were 62 of us to start with. And I remember I was the second youngest, and it, it was intimidating. I had never experienced that before, so it really opened my eyes. And the pace that you move at from that first day is phenomenal. If I just put the hard work in, kept my head down, kept my mouth shut, knuckled down, worked hard, and eventually, and hopefully, first time through, I'm gonna be able to achieve earning my Green Beret. The first thing that strikes me about this place is that it hasn't changed. You know, 16 years later, and this place is still pretty much exactly the same as it was when I was starting my training here. This is the place that molded me. And, and made me go from a 17-year-old boy into a man. When you look back on it, you only ever see the good stuff, right? And even the bad stuff, you laugh about it because it's character building and it, it, it molds you into who you are. You know, there's nothing dangerous happens or anything, you know, too far, but it's baptism by fire. And, and if you can just accept it and roll with it, then you grow. Go, go, go. Away we go.
Bezzy Opel, without a shadow of a doubt, was a guy called Sammy Watman. Now, Sammy comes from Glasgow, so the complete other end of the country. I think he was about 23, 24 uh, when he started training. As a young Marine, Mark was, was a good lad. He was a very good lad. A tough lad as well. You know, um, when he came in, he, he was 17 year old. Um, when he joined the Marines, that was when I first met him. And uh, I was a wee bit older, I was, I was 21. Uh, a lot of experience in the doors and kind of the rough areas of Glasgow, if you like, you know, so kind of through the mill. And uh, when, I first, when I first met Mark, I took a shine at him as well because he kind of stuck out in the troop as being a bit of a grafter. I mean, he had the kickboxing background and stuff like that as well, uh, which kind of served him well. But, you know, he was, was kind of cocky. He was, he was kind of Van Damme cocky. You know, you'd be standing doing your locker and fixing things in it and you'd turn around the next minute, you've got the solely a size 10 just hovering at your face. You know, you'd be standing there kind of like, wow. Even though he was slightly younger than me in training, we were both we both never had any military experience, so it didn't really matter. It was really the comradeship that, that kind of got us through it all, Matt, you know. I kind of looked to him for a bit of guidance and strength. Um, and he, he had seen a lot as a civilian as well. You know, he had an interest in life. We were two of the few that made it from day one through the pass out as originals. So that was kind of cool. I met Becky here in Plymouth. Uh, Becky's originally from Staines, or as she calls it, St. Ains. Um, and she came down with five of her mates to do a top-up degree at, at Plymouth Uni. I was working as a doorman at a club called Reflex, a cheesy 80s club. And she used to come in um, most weekends, and I kind of, I, I took a shine to her. I don't, I don't know what it was, I didn't really even speak to her for a couple of times I saw her. And I asked her out, and she kept turning me down. And then one day, and just as a joke, I said to her, look, if you don't give me your number, I'm gonna ban you from the club. You can't come in, and neither can your friends. There was something about him um, that I did very much have a guard up. But yeah, we did, did fall quite quickly. We had been together, it hadn't been that long before I got injured. We got together Christmas time, 2006 and then pretty much Christmas time 2007 was when I got injured. I'll never forget it now, I just heard a massive, massive explosion. And the first thing I said was, oh shit, um, this, is, this is real. You know, I actually remember thinking to myself, you're just having a nightmare, Mark. When I, when I looked at one of the guys, you know, his, his face was in shock. Because it was Christmas Eve, I remember having red tinsel in my boots and I had uh, red tinsel in my hair. I remember picking my hand up and kind of looking at it and it was actually in pretty good nick, but the rest of my arm was trashed. I just kind of dropped that hand into the sand and I was in constant communications with my uh, OC, uh, who was in communications with the Mert back at um, Camp Bastion. The flight time was, was only about 12-15 about minutes. We, th we think that there are two casualties, um, but that's all, all we've got for you. It's, it's so difficult to explain the speed at what your brain is working at in this situation, but how slow everything seems to be going on around you. We had to get into a room and clear our way in because we didn't know whether we were in a minefield. If I die now, I'm quite happy with that. You know, because to me that was an honourable way to die. There were, there were four of us, four of us on the team. There was um, a doctor, a paramedic, uh, Sergeant Keith Mills, and then there was our um, combat med tech. I'd done, done quite a few missions by this time. I, I, got, I got used to the routine. It was a bit of a, bit of a drill, if you like. My medic then had to go make his way to Mark, um, otherwise Mark would have bled out, so he got, got to Mark, started working on him. He, he got in, he gave me pain relief, because to this point now, again, I, I couldn't comprehend the time, but I was starting to feel the effects of things now, my adrenaline was wearing off. Because I had my eyes closed um, and I was bleeding out, you know, for me to interact 
at some sort of level, the medic was quite important to him to keep me conscious and keep me responsive. So he was talking to me, he was trying to get me involved in the tourniquets on, trying to give me something to do, just to make sure I didn't you know, close my eyes, give up, and then fade the black. Got him on the back of my ATMP. At this stage now, we've got drips in him, the tourniquet up, morphine was starting to kick in sort of thing. Um, Mark, it was clearly Mark was in a bad way. I was grabbing out of Mark, which I thought was, a, was on a stretcher on the back of my ATMP, because going into the fob, it was a steep hill. And what I thought I had out of the, the, uh, the stretcher was Mark's bone on his leg I had out of. Um, just to keep hold of him. The, the, one of the medics went off flying out of the back. I still had a mark, but we managed to get him in because we had to make a decision where we were going to bring in the Merc because potentially it was a minefield. And the last thing I remember is the helicopter landing, the sandstorm that the propeller blades created, the heat from the exhaust, and then the mechanical noise of the tailgate dropping as the helicopter landed and then that's when I blacked out, and that's the last thing I remember. I knew that this was serious. Um, the medic looked tired. You could tell that, you know, he'd obviously been working really hard as well. I pulled the blanket back, and my first recollection is, fuck, with a capital F. I mean, this guy presented in front of me, his fucking legs were shredded, absolutely shredded. I'll be honest, looking down on this patient just took my breath away. I, I think even, I think we all did, but I, I remember literally being quite shocked and I, I froze for a couple of seconds because I'd never seen such horrific injuries in my entire life. Is, is he alive? He was very pale. He obviously wasn't awake. And my first fear was, oh my goodness, I, I think he's dead. Bleeding had stopped, but he was quite evident that there's every chance that, that, that this guy's just gonna, just gonna fucking bleed to death uh, unless we nail this now. How, how are we gonna resuscitate this, this guy? How are we gonna do it? I've got, I've got no place, but we've, we've got no place but needles. Uh, we've got something called um, an intraosseous gun, an easy IO gun it was, we were using at the time. Um, landmarks. We didn't have any landmarks. Normally we put them into his tibia, which is your shin basically. Um, not an option. Mark didn't have any tibia left. I remember saying, just fucking give me the IO gun. Give me the IO gun between me and Charlie. We just, we just had to do what we, we did. Charlie was, was talking to Mark and, 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 and I can only assume, reassure. I remember looking at him. I remember looking at his face and um, he, was, he was blonde. He, um, was it was a, a young young marine, um, and I remember looking in his eyes, and they were they were um, like a pale blue, a blue colour, and I just thought, my goodness me, this boy is somebody's possibly husband, uh, brother, son, and I remember looking further down and looking at the blood that was just everywhere. I said to Charlie, I said, just, just chuck us the IO gun, just chuck us the easy IO gun. And I remember thinking, fuck this, I'm, it, it, it's fucking all or nothing here. So I just remember picking it up. I remember sort of thinking to myself, oh, I'm just going, I've got to put this in the pelvis. It's going to the fucking pelvis. I've never done this before. This is going to be a bit, this is going to be a bit sporting. I just remember just drilling into it, drilling into it and thinking, fuck, I think that went in, you know. I think we've, I think we've trumped it. The relief of knowing that we got it in was just brilliant, absolutely amazing, because right now Mark was unconscious, he had no blood pressure, he just about had a pulse, but he needed, he needed some sort of fluid to regain some sort of circulation. I remember landing on at the hospital landing site at Camp Bastion uh, a few minutes later. All of a sudden, I remember Mark's eyes fluttering, and I was like, Oh my goodness, wow, that's, that looks good. And he opened his eyes very briefly and, tr and he was trying to say something, but he had an oxygen mask on his face. And uh, I quickly took the oxygen mask off and I said, Mark, are you okay? And <laughs> he said to me, he, he just said to me, my ass hurts. Those were the three words that he said to me and and that was it. <laughs> that was me. 
was an emotional, uh, emotional Christmas Eve, one that will sit with me for the rest of my days, I've no doubt. I think for me that was the moment when I thought, I think he's going to be okay. That's how I will always feel. If anybody asks me about it, I get so upset. You know, as I think about the day that you did it, just think about now. Yeah. I'm still here, I'm still handsome. I love you dearly. Me too. It was a knock at the door and there was two men stood there. And I said, yes, what can I do for you, please? So they said, are you Mark's? Nan, we got to talk to you. So I made them a cup of tea and they sat down and then they told me what had happened. And I just went to pieces. I couldn't understand. Your mind does overdrive. You just, you've got all these thoughts and feelings going around. All I wanted to do was get to him, go see him. Is he going to be okay? Is he gonna make it? I just kind of looked up at the time. I had the phone in my hand, and I'm like, "Please, please, don't, don't do this to me," you know. And I, 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 I emotionally was, I wasn't broken, crying wise, but inside I was devastated. You know, I felt like my whole soul had left my body. I still had it in my head that it wasn't him. It couldn't be him, and someone else was gonna get some terrible news on Christmas Day. His face was completely unmarked. Um, he just looked dirty and very tanned. Um, he was still my mark. He was back home and he was safe. Yeah, I remember the first time he woke up and he was saying something to me and he kept on saying it and saying it and I just could not understand what he was saying and he actually said it quite a few times before I actually got what he was saying. And he had asked me to marry him. And as soon as I got it, I was like, did you just ask me to marry you? And he was like, oh, yes, a sigh of relief that I'd finally got what he was saying. Um, and no sooner did I say yes, that he was asleep again and kind of it took all his energy, bless him, to to ask me, but that was the first thing he asked me when he woke up. And they let us take Mark across to the flat we were staying in so he could see it. So he was in a wheelchair, we wheeled him across. The wheelchair didn't fit in any of the rooms. And I think that's where Everything just hit him all at once. And I think in his head, that was going to be him. That night, he broke down and he asked me to help him. And I just had to say to him, it's not always going to be like this. It's going to get stronger get better we're gonna make it through and it will get easier there was no way he was giving up on me and giving up on himself I wouldn't allow it she's the most resilient person I've ever met she just takes everything on the chin nothing bothers her nothing phases her you know like I say meeting a guy she's been with for a year who has three limbs blown off comes with a daughter and all that crap of the injuries and what the future held she stuck around and she was just strong, you know, resilient for, for the pair of us. Okay, this is a challenge and it's one that you'll be able to overcome because you have great support. I remember a guy coming in to speak to him and I always call him the evil Santa because he came in, he was an old guy, big white beard. He was an amputation specialist and he told me in quite a non-emotional, matter-of-fact way 
that I would never walk again. That's then mark to another kind of downhill spiral. And that for me was the moment that I tanked. I went into depression. I don't mind admitting I had suicidal thoughts. Now I don't have any regrets in my life and this is something that I haven't shared with a lot of people. Um, I had a phone call from a friend of mine, a guy called Damien Moverhill, who I served with uh, and was in Afghanistan on the same tour as me. He called me, he left me a voicemail because I didn't want to speak to anybody at that time, so I, I ignored the call. Is it okay that I come and visit you? I'm on R&R, &R. it'd be good to catch up. I didn't think I could face anybody at that time after receiving the news that I'd received, so I ignored his call. Two weeks later, Damien went back to Afghanistan and in early 2008, he was killed by an improvised explosive device. I regret not answering that call. I would have had a chance to talk to my friend, uh, a chance that I don't have now. And that's when I decided, you know, I've had my little pity party, felt down, let's just sweep that to the side and let's focus on overcoming these injuries, healing, getting myself fit and strong again, and then trying to dominate these prosthetics and prove this doctor wrong. But when I got to rehab, I set a goal that I was going to walk on the parade ground rather than be pushed on a wheelchair. So I, I just focused all my rehab and, and effort on getting to some sort of level of independence with prosthetics where I could do that. I was a company sergeant major, taking my company out on parade and from the distance I could see Mark stood there with the unit welfare officer and another guy supporting him. Mark had got his made sure he was going to get his prosthetic legs on and he was going to march out and collect his medal with the rest of us. So I kind of wanted to make everyone proud and you know show that I was still a fighter and, and I was going to overcome it. So that was a massive thing for me because that was the first real goal that I set myself. You know, as I was going through my rehab, I was getting fitter and faster and stronger and wearing my legs more. So when me and Becky got married, I wanted to walk down the aisle, stand through the ceremony and dance, uh, the first dance with Becky. I was sat down with my wife and they called the first dance. And um, oh yeah, I'll never forget it. It was, um, it was special, Mark, Mark, um, Got up there and danced with Becky. My wife, I'm welling up a little bit now. My wife um, said to me, I had to go up and whisper in his ear and say, look, I told you, it's not your dance career over. He recently married his Becky and together they walked down the aisle. His boots made him wobble, so he wore trainers and a huge smile. A month after that, I flew out to America because I was the, the first triple amputee in the UK from Afghan, I'd, I'd found a mentor online, a guy who was hit by a train uh, called Cameron Clapp, and became a triple amputee back in 2002. So we had been communicating, uh, and I ended up going to meet him on 9th of June 2009, where him and his team trained me to live independently with my prosthetics. And that was the last time I used a wheelchair. I remember when I first met Mark, I knew that Mark had the capability and the determination. Uh, he had he had the right attitude. I got to to see him as an, a triple amputee, just like myself. And we got to rally around. I myself was there as a mentor uh, to Mark, and that's very important. I marked the night of June 2009 as basically my independence day, the day I gave up my wheelchair and was fully uh, independent using prosthetics. So those are probably the, the, the biggest key moments I think over the last 10 years. Obviously there's the, the children, uh, but from a recovery point of view, it's, it's that. Not so much anymore, but I used to be quite a petrol head and, and I love cars and bikes and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I thought, my initial assumption was obviously no legs, one arm, you're never going to be able to drive again. So that was kind of hard to deal with. Fortunately, thanks to some very clever people that I met over in the States, we got around that issue and 
now I drive using my prosthetics. It's given me another level of independence um, because it hasn't restricted me to one vehicle. In essence, the technology behind it is Bluetooth. So I have a remote control, like you said, that is paired with my knees. Basically, this is how it works. Um, so I have this little remote, turn it on, and then I want the right genium, okay? So I'll push that, and it will start searching for it. If you look at the back of the knee now, you see there's a blue light flashing, yeah. so that means it's hooked up. And then it asks what mode I want to be in, basic mode, driving mode, locked mode, gym mode, cycling mode, Okay, so those are all the modes I've got. I'm in driving at the minute. I go back to basic mode, and if you watch the leg when I push the button, that's now ready to walk again. And then you just brake and accelerate, like anyone else would. Definitely do not walk for me. It takes between 300 and 500% more energy for a bilateral above knee amputee to get around day to day, so you know, if I'm if I'm stood on the spot, say well, I'm at a speaking event and I'm and I'm stood on the spot on stage for an hour, that is like, you know, an able-bodied person presenting for an hour, but jogging on the spot while they're doing it. And then, you know, when I'm walking to wherever I'm going, they're running. You know, it's constantly burning up energy uh, all day long because because um, I don't have any knees. So they definitely do not walk for me. It takes a lot of effort to walk using knees, but the technology in them is is pretty far advanced. So this is my, my home office. This is where I do a lot of my work. Uh, when I work for the Royal Marines Association, the Royal Marines Charity, when I'm doing all my social media stuff, uh, whatever the case may be, this is my little quiet zone and my little, my little den of narcissism, if you like, because I have adorned the walls of this place with you know, memorabilia from events I've been involved in, which I'm very proud to have been a part of. I just tell you a few of the things that are here. So there's a picture of the medals day, the day I got my personal service medal after our tour, um, presented to me by my good friend, uh, Bob Toomey. Just here on the wall is uh, the red shirt. That is from an event way back in 2010. We ran 3,563 miles from New York to LA as a, as a team. The one in the middle, was back from 2012 when they had the Olympic torch relay that ran around the UK. Another event I did in 2012, which was called Tour de Forces. It was involved with some of the guys that were on the Gumpathon, so the run we did. I hand cycled, they upright cycled um, from Plymouth here, anti-clockwise around the country, which was, I believe, 3,103 miles. Like the Gumpathon, a charity event, physical event, raising money for military charities. There is the, the front and rear cover of my first book, Man Down, that came out in 2009. Some boxing gloves signed by Mike Tyson and Joe Calzaghe. We got the Batman vs Superman poster signed by Henry Cavill when I spoke at that event up in London. It's great having all this signed stuff. You know, in the grand scheme of things, that's probably the most important one to me. You know, it says a son's first hero, a daughter's first love uh, with dad, and it's got my children's name in it. This, I don't know, you can't, you can't do this stuff without them, you know what I mean? It's, um, and it's not as fulfilling either, is it? When you're dead, it doesn't matter how many Lamborghinis you own, how much money you've got, how big your house is. The only thing people are going to remember is really what kind of person you were. Were you a dick? Were you generous with your time? Were you grounded? Were you arrogant? You know, did you do stuff for others or were you selfish? That's what they're going to remember. Right now we are off to the Commando Training Centre Royal Marines, aka the Dream Factory, where boys enter and legends leave. I've actually got a full-time job working for the Royal Marines Association and I didn't really want to leave the Corps either, like most of us don't like get injured. And it felt then like I wasn't actually leaving. So, it, you know, I, I, I know I'm very lucky um, you know, not, not everyone gets these kind of opportunities. I was very lucky to have it. 
I do this every roughly two weeks, maybe four weeks at a push. Uh, I'll come up here and I'll give a presentation to the guys that are in week 28 about the RMA, um, about what we do, who we are, who we help, how we can help them and their families, should they ever find themselves in times of need, how they can get involved and help us uh, if they ever want to. And I kind of do my best to dispel the myths that you know, there are no young serving or retired Royal Marines involved in the army because there are, there are a lot. I was medically discharged from the Corps and that was back in July 2010. And fortunately for me, uh, four weeks after I was discharged, I landed a job working with these guys, the Royal Marines Association or the RMA. Now, over the years, as the RMA grew in, in size and in popularity, it started to become quite obvious that a lot of the members of the RMA had issues. Now, they could be financial issues, health issues, employment issues, whatever the case may be. You know, I still feel, what we're in now 2017, so seven years later, I still feel like I'm actually serving because I'm around it nearly every day. This morning I went down to Stonehouse Barracks and 30 Commando, which is our HQ, and I met with Sam, who's the unit, well, one of the unit PTIs down there, and he is a, a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and he thinks that I can gain a lot from it. Um, you know, physically, mentally. So I'm looking forward to getting started. We're gonna have our first one-on-one -on -one session Tuesday. Uh, no prosthetics on, and we're gonna build from the ground up and then see what it is that I can do and how we can adapt things. We, um, we met in the mess at 30 Commando. Um, we just had a wet, just chatting about what he was doing here at the time. Um, he was here supporting uh, Remembrance Day. Um, we just uh, talking about my role here and then about Jiu Jitsu. What was great was to learn about the martial art that Mark did before his injury. He was um, heavily involved in Muay Thai competitively. So it was very, very apparent that Mark was a natural fighter. And he was talking about the fact that he thought he'd never be able to sort of do a martial art again. What we spoke about was the opportunity to get on the mat and, uh, and give Jiu Jitsu a go. His, his core strength is phenomenal, you know, because for years he's had to learn to walk again, all right, using his prosthetics. So, um, so his core strength is very, very strong, the way he can move around the mat, the way he can move around me. Because he's got that uh, combat mindset, you know, that's why when I spoke to him about Jiu Jitsu, he wanted a piece of it straight away because um, Mark is not the sort of person who likes um, likes to be mollycoddled or anything like that. You know, he wants to earn something through grit, determination, and hard work, and that's what jiu-jitsu is. Probably Christmas 2016, when I was sat down and I was going through this process I do with goal setting for the following year. In my health and fitness, I, I was doing really well in you know, keeping myself fit and training, but I, I needed another go. And I kind of felt that I needed to compete at something, but I didn't know what. And then I saw these other guys doing the Invictus Games, and I saw how well they did and, and how popular it was. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll have a go at that. I went into it really naively, thinking, I'm quite fit, I'm a former Royal Marine, I'll just turn up there, go hell for leather and, and win. And then when I went to the first training camp, I saw how good these guys were and I was like, I need to put some work in now and it's not going to be easy. And right now, my recovery is pretty quick. I really need some coaching on this. Someone to tell me what gear I need to be and when, I think that's the problem. My, my fitness, I think it's pretty good. I'm recovered already now, I could go again. But it's just, when I'm, when I'm like, ah, grizzing it out, everyone seems to just go past me like this. Now I insta fam, we are done. That is the cycling trials down here at Odd Down Camp uh, finished. seen is disgusting um, it's the only sport that they've got there where they put a sick bucket beside the machine um, because a lot of people do 
throw up at the end of it, but the four minutes was all right. I got 8.44, my personal best is 889, but my arm came off uh, three minutes into it, so I just had to crack a minute um, with one arm. I came third. I was the only, uh, in classifications, it's called IR, so it's IR one to six, one being my classification, two, three, four, meaning your injuries are lessened. And so I was the IR one, the rest were IR twos. So I came third, which wasn't too bad. If I had my arm on, I think I could have done a bit better. And then I came first in the one minute sprint. Um, I don't know what my meter was. I don't know if I got a personal best, um, but I was happy with the performance. So it's been a good day, um, personally, physically, and now I am ready to eat and refuel and then recover, mate, because we've got swimming on Sunday and uh, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yes, I swam pre-injury, but post-injury, the first time that I got in a swimming pool again, I uh, actually, no, I nearly drowned. I, I jumped in the middle, swam down the middle. When I let out a breath, I sank quite quickly, not like I used to when I had legs, that never used to happen. So I panicked, I managed to get a breath, keep myself buoyant, took myself off to the side and then never swam again. And it wasn't until 12 months ago that I had uh, three swimming lessons from a professional coach who taught me to swim again. So now it's been a case of refining my technique, building on my technique and then trying to increase my performance. So it's all kind of new to me. Gonna see if Daddy's made the team. Gonna see if Daddy's made the team. Shall I read it? Okay, dear Mark Wormrod, thank you for your patience throughout the Invictus Games selection process. We are delighted to congratulate you on your selection for the UK Invictus Games team. Yes! Come on, Thank you. Thank you. I'm chuffed to bits. To be honest, it's been a long day waiting for the team to come in. Um, but we got the news that we wanted. So on one level, I'm elated. On another level, I'm slightly nervous because it means now that this is serious and this is happening. And I'm really, really, really going to have to start ramping up my training and aiming everything that I do from today to the day we compete towards the Invictus Games. Trusty old Helen, my faithful handbike that you guys all know about. As much as I love her and as, as well as she served me and she's got me to this point, um, she isn't fit for purpose when it comes to racing on a handbike. So I brought her up here today to show the guys at Draft my setup and the, how it works for me when I've got a prosthetic yeah. arm on, how the gears are set up, what kind of you know tires and all that kind of stuff is, my seating position. And they're then going to assess me today for a brand new uh, custom built bike. And hopefully we can get that done pretty quickly um, so I can take it home. Not today, obviously, it's going to be a couple of weeks yet. But then get out on the road and test this thing, test myself, uh, get used to it, learn how it all works, and then just train, 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 train. Because you're in your locked in position, it's all upper body, isn't it? You're not wasting any energy well, like, that's it. in your I've lower body. I've been the same body. for the last five months, so I'm sliding down like this. You know, no disrespect to Helen here. I love her to pieces. 
but I'm just excited now to get a new bike and, and get out on it and it felt so comfortable in that, that new position being so low down to the floor and kind of powering up rather than down like I do at the minute and I just want to get out there now get the bike hit the road and, and just start training I'm just so keen to get out there now and start training and, and developing and, and building myself up Knowing Mark as he is, is uh, one who takes a challenge on anyway, he takes it very seriously. Uh, he wants to succeed in what he does. But with regard to health benefits, coming here, he's obviously making himself fitter, faster and stronger. We're all about prevention, we're all about maintenance, to make sure he's in a correct way of training, he's got good form, and to make sure he can sustain that level of training so he succeeds at the Invictus. As an amputee, for anyone that's, that's missing both their legs, um, I would advise that they came along and they had regular sports massages because it's about prevention rather than cure. You need to be proactive with your life and if you're a full-time prosthetic user, then you need to look after your body like you would if you were a full-time athlete. So it's something that I did loosely before, but now with the training, because that's intensified, I want to do it a lot more because I need to put a lot more of my focus on recovery. Uh, I've, I've neglected that in the past when I was younger. Yeah, now I'm a little yeah. bit older, I feel it more. The amount of work he's going to put through, he obviously puts through like 10 times more than we do. Mm. Able bodied, and obviously Mark now absolutely smashing the fitness. Working really hard, his muscles are going to get tired, fatigued. And uh, this is what we're just going to do now maintain him, push any form of toxins out, any badness out, and get his uh, mobility back in. Mark, the, uh, the owner here, is an ex Matlow PTI. So when I'm not at the Invictus Games training camps getting coaching in these disciplines that I don't know much about, I can get professional coaching from Mark and some tips on how to improve my core strength, you know, on the battle ropes, on the rower, um, any other kind of circuit training that I can do. That's all beneficial eventually to the three disciplines that I'm doing at the Invictus Games. Right, I'm going to have a quick pee actually. I think you just squeezed all the piss out of me. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> We're learning, you know, the recovery part of it is learning for me um, and then incorporating different styles of training, so circuit training, core specific training, strength and conditioning training. It's all new and it's all, for me, focusing in on better performance in my races. I think I spend half my life in service stations. We have landed in Redden, but we're here for the, the penultimate uh, Invictus Games rowing camp. So we're on a, on a two day camp right now. I don't know what time it is now, it's probably about 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. It's time to, to rest, relax, uh, delim, as I like to, to term it, and then get ready to get up tomorrow and head over to the gym uh, to meet the rest of the team. There. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Every night I do this. Every night and every morning. Oh, I've got to get the hip flexors. I think it quite tight. That's all it is, a bit of maintenance. Once in the morning, once in the evening. And then the groin as well. It's job done. All right, so we are here. We're early as normal i've got a ridiculously early because i hate being late but um the team is starting to turn up now uh, we'll go in in about 20 minutes we'll meet the coaches find out what we're doing for the next two days and then get down to business
particularly strong today with, with rowing. I feel sick, if I'm honest, really sick at the minute in my, in my stomach. Um, I don't know, this is just something you've got to do every day because you take like four or five days off and you go back again and it just feels like you start from day one again. That was, that was brutal, mate. Thank you know, some, some of these camps to this point, particularly the first one, when I've not done this before, were hard, but that was, that was brutal. From the minute we got here this morning, it was just, I don't know, mate, it just hurt a lot more than the other ones did, uh, which is good, you know, because we need to, I feel I need to be doing this now at some level every day. I've got cramps. I don't normally get cramp ever. And I'm getting cramps in my, in my thighs. Oh, I'm making a right mess of this. Since day one of rowing, there have been issues. To start with, my, my prosthetic used to come off um, because of the sweat. Then once we figured that out, the hand used to come off the handle. It gradually worked its way down the handle and that would pop off and we fixed that. I don't have any concerns. I'm, a, I'm actually glad it's happened here. No matter what happens there, I personally have grown a lot through this, through sport. I wish I'd got into this a lot sooner, really, because um, it's been mega beneficial for me physically and mentally. We're done. That's day two over, and today was equally as brutal as yesterday. It was a challenging day. It's been a challenging two days. They've been pretty tough sessions, but they've been good. They've been rewarded. Well, so this is an NHS centre, which is predominantly civilians who are amputees, and I don't think a lot of them see anyone who's missing both legs above the knee walking independently because it's um, it's very difficult to do initially and um, there's a lot of rehab involved you know as you know when we went through rehab it was eight hours a day five days a week for months and months and months but these guys don't get that luxury it's like two hours a week maybe two hours a month so it's a lot harder to progress so when they then they see you walk in you know independently carrying two limbs and a socket and being on the phone and you know, without wheelchairs or carers or anything, it's something I don't think a lot of them see that much. Um, which is frustrating because, you know, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So what have you got with you today? You've got liners and, so, if you're doing a cast, then we do. Yeah, so this is the arm that I've got, that I'm using. Yeah. This, if we've got time, needs repairing as well. Okay. Good. That one, I'm having to jump on it just to get it to click once right. and get in, but when it's in, it's in. Yeah, hear that? Yeah. So that's because cool. yeah, at the minute I'm, I'm panicking now. If that goes, this is already got yeah. nothing to train with. Yeah. Yeah. This one repaired. This one replicated. Yeah. This socket on there. Yeah. When I was at the the Invictus Games trials and I was hand biking, we did ten laps and my arm basically fell off four laps in. So I had to do six laps with the arm. The sock was down here and then it just grates on the bone. And it's just painful as hell. It's rocking that the inside of that socket, the arm just rocking constantly on the end of the bum. So because of all this, the training I'm doing from Victor's with the rowing and the hand biking, they're, they're getting smashed. So I need some backups so my training can be consistent. Because at the minute it's taking a bit of a slowdown, if you like, um, because I only have the one arm to, to use. So I'm going to be a little bit more gentle. Uh, we're training, so hopefully we'll get cast, come back up in a week or two, um, have a carbon socket made, and then maybe a week after that, have hopefully three new arms built so I can just go hard again in those final weeks before the Invictus Games. Perfect. Thank you. This whole Invictus Games thing, it is about using sport to progress your recovery physically and mentally. It's about, you know, getting involved, taking part, you know, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and, and making yourself realise really what you're capable of. But for me, I really want to take it 
as far as I can because I only plan to do this once and then I'll take my foot off the gas with respect to all of this kind of stuff. But I've got an opportunity now here to come in and, and really get scientific and you know, not only for my training for Invictus but for myself, my own self-learning, go into this lab now and get tested. I didn't know anyone who was disabled and your automatic assumption is it's game over and you're in a wheelchair and your life's going to be shit. That's what you assume, that's, that's what the first week of my life post-injury was consumed with thoughts like that. But then you very quickly, well I, I very quickly got over that and just thought, so you know, this is my situation, there's nothing I can do about it, these are not going to grow back, but surely I can have some quality of life. And then as I went through hospital and I went through rehab, I realised actually that could be a really good quality of life if I'm willing to put the work in, you know, and leave the wheelchair behind, master the prosthetics, you know, and then find out what's on offer to me in life, generally as a triple amputee, and take the opportunities and take advantage of it. But not only that, push it. Come on, 30 seconds. Keep going. Three, two, one. <laughs> I've kind of had that mindset since I was about 15 years old anyway, so it was, that's exactly how I looked at it. It was Limston again for me, you know, I did my Royal Marines training, 30 weeks there, that's one block of my life. Rehab is another block of my life. I didn't know how long it was going to be, I just knew the more effort I put in, the quicker it would be over and I could get on with my life. A race now, but because I've got a minute into a three minute race, and everything on, went. Mate. Thanks, man, appreciate it. What's this for then? Invictus Games. Get on. Yeah, flying out on Thursday. What are you doing down here? Boat. Oh, yeah? Oh, I, I live at Bartow. Okay. Yeah, and I uh, cycle here every day, uh, 10 mile a day, to keep the old man going. Nice to see you, Mike. Nice to see you too. Thank you. You're doing the call well. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Just seeing him get up every single day and pushing himself to as, as far as he can push himself, and he does that day in, day out. And Mark can sometimes put a bit of a front on, and people don't see behind closed doors. And if he isn't feeling 100%, that gets to him. And I mean, no one, so many Invictus, Everyone just wants him to go out there, do what he can, win, lose or draw. Everyone's so proud of him. But he puts a bar up there and he challenges himself and there's not necessarily a need for it. Um, I don't know why he does it, but he is his biggest critic, his biggest challenge is just yeah, but I mean, we are so proud of him, kind of, no matter what. I am so proud of him because he's never sat back and relaxed about anything. If he's going to do it, he's determined and he will do it. Don't matter what it takes out of him, he will still do it. And I am so proud of him. I love him dearly. He's always had that attitude, don't ever tell me I can't do something. So for someone to tell him you're never going to walk again, you'll be wheelchair bound for the rest of your life, is he's immediately stuck two fingers up to that and thought, well, I'm going to prove you all wrong. That is his personality. And he's always been like that, don't ever tell me I can't do something because I will do it and I'll do it 10 times better than what you ever thought I could. It's amazing what he has achieved. How are feeling? Yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Hope everyone else is ready. I didn't really come here for rehab as such. I did, in a way, but I came here and I geared all my training up to come in here to be the best that I could be, you know? And, and that, to me, means winning medals. That was my uh, version of success, was coming here and meddling in all my events. When I'm here in my hotel room and I'm on my own and you have time to think about it and get inside your head, I was feeling a bit nervous. But since last night, you know, it's all kind of gone. The nerves have gone and more of the excitement has taken over. And I feel like I've been sat here for weeks just waiting to compete.
Invictus is about the dedication of the men and women who serve their countries, confronting hardship and refusing... So we've been here a couple of days now. Uh, the games have officially kicked off. We've done the opening ceremonies uh, and it has been uh, honestly fantastic so far. Now, I have been training, uh, rowing and cycling for the last couple of days and it's been good. What's Comment, your name? Uh, Mark Wormrod. Mark what? Wormrod. Once your seat is set up on there, it will not come back off it until after racing. Ready? Got to get set up on a monorail first apparently. To get on one side. I'm not a, an experienced cyclist. I only got my bike 10 days before I came out here and I've never ever raced uh, a bike in my life. So I've, it's been a steep learning curve, but it's been an enjoyable one. I've been out this morning with Pinky the coach. We've been riding the time trial track and the crit race track and he's been helping me with uh, my lines and gear selection that kind of stuff and then giving me some advice on how to run the criterion race because I've never done that before either so I've learned a lot I feel a lot more comfortable than I did a month ago and rowing as well you know, I'm feeling strong with the rowing if I'm honest um, that wasn't the case when I first got here. We had a couple of sessions and I was feeling a little bit, maybe it was the jet lag, but I was feeling a little bit run down and tired, but that seems to have gone now. And last night's session was a good one where I felt strong. It's all about to kick off tomorrow morning. I've got all my stuff prepped. I've done everything that I can to get myself as best prepared as I can for these races. And so like I said, I'm just gonna go out there and uh, give it my all see what we can do. with mechanical issues and yet to finish. I don't know, man. I don't know. I guess it's just one of those things. You know, I've, I've prepped everything perfect, right? I was on the start line and I, I was mega hydrated. I'd eaten right. I was literally, I could feel the energy in me ready to go. The minute he said go, and I put power through my crank, for some reason, the left handle moved forward. Right, so instead of doing this, literally from the first push, I'm doing this, right? And then I got to, I was going and I said, okay, it's all right, we'll, we can work with this. I've never ever done this before, but I'm gonna race. So I was racing, racing, racing. It made cornering quite hard. I took the right, the first right corner, picked it up, picked the gears up, uh, three gears, flew down the hill. Took, there was a sharp corner, and because my hands were like this, I tried taking it. Normally I like that, and the wheel would turn. So I had to lean my whole body over to turn around the corner. The whole back end, the right hand side lifted. My elbow was just, and my forearm was skimming the concrete, and I threw my body back over because I was aiming towards to take a major crash. And I managed to get it back, and I straightened up, and right at the bottom of the dip, there's a storm drain that runs the entire length of the path. And I hit that, and it hurts anyway, but normally you just you sit like that, you hit over it, and you're gone. And as I hit it, my chain just went and exploded off the crank. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing, mate, you, you're gonna see 
not an angry man, but someone that's channeling a lot of anger tonight when I'm rowing, mate. I, am, I don't normally get annoyed. This is like my first time I've ever raced, and that happens, right? And I am beyond fucking pissed off. Beyond fucking pissed off. Feel what it felt like, and then when the opportunity arose, 
go past him and take him, and I, I did that in the first couple of laps, and I was just, you know, that was it for me. I was like, happy days. I'm definitely, definitely keeping this up. Even, even then, going around that speed, I was just thinking so much more, looking at the, the, the dips and the troughs, going this gear, that gear, this gear, that gear, go left line, tuck in left there, sweep out there, come around there. What I have to do now is completely change my mindset. The swimming is all relax and reach, relax and don't go, 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 because you just, you don't get anywhere in a swimming pool. No, I am feeling good. I'm feeling good about swimming. Especially at 100 metres where I've got to be careful, because you dive in and you automatically want to go for it. But I know that for me, I have to take a steady crawl for the 50 and then gun it on the 50 back. My biggest thing is going to be controlling my adrenaline and sticking to the game plan. We, we did absolutely everything we could and I remember somebody coming up to me afterwards saying um, okay yeah you've done a great job but there's no, no denying that but actually do you think you've done him a favour in the long run? And that shocked me to, to my core and I think for, for weeks afterwards you know I, I had to think about what that person said to me and think okay so this is a young fit marine um, who who hasn't got any legs and he hasn't got the use of his right arm anymore. Um, did we do him a favour by, by saving him or would a hero's death have been better? It stayed with me for, for, for months after that, thinking have we done the right thing. But then I think when I heard from um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that Mark was doing really, really well, I thought actually, don't, don't you dare say things like that to your team. Don't you dare put that doubt in, your, in people's minds because we're here to save lives. Um, if, if it's not going to be the case, then you know, let the greater power decide what happens to those people. But I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have people saying things like that. That's not up to me to decide. It says a son's first hero, a daughter's first love, uh, with dad and it's got my children's name in it. This, I don't know, you can't, you can't do this stuff without them, you know what I mean? It's, um, and it's not as fulfilling either, is it? The first thing I heard was the word Royal Marines. So my ears pricked up and I thought, ideal, one of our guys has got it, you know, Royal Marines, UK, you know, in, in our team. And so I started listening a bit more and they started reading the citation a little bit more. And it became apparent to me about four seconds into it that they were, they were talking about me and they were reading a citation about me. I kind of didn't believe it at first, but as they read more and more, you know, it was kind of undeniable that it was me that they were, they were talking about. You know, it, it was just surreal, you know. I, I couldn't believe that after this journey that I'd been on and, and all this stuff that we had done in those days in Invictus, that I was topping it all off by winning this, you know, really outstanding award.
Thank you. Whoa, Bristol. Bristol. ITV Bristol. I'm gonna do something down there. And then back to Plymouth. After 200 yards. Come to relax. Hello. Hello. Hi Mark, it's Matt again, BBC Somerset. You okay? I'm good, mate. You? Yeah, thanks very much for stopping your journey. How was ITV today, alright? Yeah, no, we did uh, Lorraine this morning in London. I've just come out of ITV Bristol. Um, how, did, how did Lorraine? What's she like? Yeah, she's awesome. She's very, very good at making me feel relaxed. Described by Prince Harry as Britain's answer to Superman, those images of the pair embracing really did define this year's competition. Please welcome Mark. <laughs> Thank you for coming in and congratulations. Oh my goodness me. What an amazing achievement, Mark. It was absolutely brilliant. You must be shattered. You've done brilliantly well, and I have to congratulate you, of course, um, on the four medals. Has it actually sunk in again yet? Have you had time to actually just pinch yourself and say, this is what I've done? I just haven't had five minutes to come out of orbit yet, just to kind of take it all in. All the best. Have a safe trip. Thanks for stopping for me. Thanks, mate. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye-bye. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. <sighs> Hurry up, Matt. I'm hungry. Come back with some food. The bone rattler's coming. That one's passing right through. <laughs> For me, I really want to take it as far as I can because I only plan to do this once and then I'll take my foot off the gas with respect to all of this kind of stuff. I know. What happened um, there? Um, Ha. What happened there is I got two silver medals and two bronzes, but no gold. And my OCD kicked in. What, what they do in Invictus, they, they hammer home the point that everyone has their own individual definition of what success is. And for me, the first game, it was actually as, as far-fetched and extreme as it sounds, it was to get six gold medals. A gold medal in every event, and that's why I trained so hard for it. You know what? It was all fucking worth it. Because look at the man now. He's just a living legend. And he's a role model to me. Um, and uh, good on your mucker, that's all I'll say. Fucking good on your fella. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> what I'd like for him to have a happy life, he deserves, he deserves to live well. And I also want him to raise his children and set the example of what he's always shown me, what he can do, and love him like I do. Just keep doing what you're doing. Everybody loves you, everybody thinks the world of you. You've got three smashing kids. You know, I don't say it often, but I'm, I'm proud of you and everything that you have achieved. And I'm glad to see you. You know, I'll always love you. And uh, we're lifelong friends, lifelong oppos, and long may it continue. Stand at ease, our very own brave booty. Stand easy, rammers. You've more than done your duty. I decided that I despite my issues and despite my challenges, was still in control of my future. And so I decided to do what I could to create the best life that I could for myself. Change the way you think about the adversity that you face in your life. Don't look at it as adversity. Don't look at it as hard. Don't look at it as difficult. Don't look at it as challenging. Look at it as an opportunity to grow, as an opportunity to be a better person, as an opportunity to Get yourself one step closer to becoming what I like to call the ultimate version of yourself. You know, life is full of challenges. That's what makes it exciting. And we've got to attack those challenges head on. Don't run away from them, run towards them. Run towards them screaming like a lunatic, you know, knowing in your heart, in your head, and in everything that you have, that you can overcome that. And you will overcome that. And that's where the real juice and the excitement from life comes from. Brilliant. Cool. Let's go eat.